So it's finally fall, which means it's recruiting season. And for my days of job hunting, this meant torturing my introverted self at career fairs, putting aside exams and P-sets to reverse a linked list for an hour, and applying to jobs like this and expecting a reply back. And I do know that this year's recruiting season will look a little different, so having a good resume will help you stand out to land that dream job and make your parents proud. So I did some digging to find all of my resumes from back in the day, including the one I used to apply to internships. So how about we take a trip down memory lane and see how truly atrocious these resumes were, but how somehow they were enough to keep me employed for a few years. I also want to thank DataCamp for sponsoring this video. DataCamp's online learning community makes it easy to teach yourself data science from home, even as a beginner. We'll get to that in a little bit, but for now, let's start roasting these resumes. So here is a resume that I used to apply to Amazon. And as you can see, it's just one page long, which is pretty much a standard. And I mean, that makes sense because who wants to read a 1000 word essay on some 18 year old college kid? Well, if we rewind to 2014, I clearly didn't consider that when I sent this three page atrocity to MIT researchers. And I had so much fluff here. Like, apparently I thought people would care about my AP scholar certificate, or my summer job as a babysitter, or as I said, childcare provider, or the classic proficiency with Microsoft Word, or my fluency with Telugu, which we all know is pretty far from the truth. And we've all been there, trying to take what is probably this much information and making it fill a full resume. But honestly, employers know what they're getting into when they hire a college freshman. They know that you won't have any experience and will have a lot to learn. But you'll also be like a sponge, ready to pick up whatever they throw at you such that you can be molded and mentored over time. So it's pretty crazy to think that somehow my future research mentor could look past all of that gibberish and actually give me a chance where I could woo her with my charm which was actually just a lot of enthusiasm for the role and a little bit of desperation. Okay, back to the Amazon resume. At the very top here, I got my name and contact information. And I actually do have my mailing address here, which a lot of resume guides suggest, but TBH, it's pretty irrelevant nowadays. So I would just take that out. And recruiters do read your resumes from top to bottom. So obviously the top should have the most important information. So like most students, I put all of my education history right at the top. And again, I do have some fluff here, like my first year award in chemistry and the name of my high school, which again, no one really cares about. I do also have my GPA here right before I started to slip as CS took over my life. And this is another common trend to put both your average GPA and your CS GPA, especially if the CS one is higher. Moving down a little bit more, we've got the technical skills section. Now this is all right, but I did manage to sneak in my Excel and stats skills, which honestly weren't even that good. And besides that, I probably just move everything down to the bottom since there is nothing really special here anyways. Now to the juicy part, the experience section. And I remember when I used to screen resumes, this was the most important part, rightfully so. But that put me in quite the pickle because remember back then I was a college junior applying to all of these top tech internships but had no experience in tech before. So obviously the ideal would have been having all that experience to list here, but I didn't have that. Instead, I had three years of experience at my neuroscience lab, the one with the really bad resume. And when I was there, I made some real contributions like designing novel hardware and contributing to a published paper. This is something that probably would have wooed a medical school a lot more than Google, but it was something. And here I did my best to highlight all of my leadership experience and quantifiable contributions. 
For example, I mentioned that I not only designed this injectro thing, but also taught three other undergrads how to fabricate it. And for the research paper, I also added how many other scientists and undergrad students worked on it. This way, they knew that I wasn't just sitting in the corner pipetting away, but was actually making tangible contributions. But yeah, that was the good, but there was also a lot of ugly here. The rest of the section was just a whole bunch of BS. Like, apparently I assisted with the development of a website using MongoDB, which was actually just giving design feedback at the dinner table for my dad's company. So that was not my proudest moment. I don't recommend that you do that, but I'm pretty sure that most people could see right through all that fluff anyways. Now, while landing a job to build that experience section is based on factors out of your control, completing a project is all you. And there really is no secret sauce to the perfect project. It should just be something that's unique and genuinely interesting to you. So that's what I tried to do here with my selected project section. And it's pretty funny how I chose the word selected here, as if I actually had all of these projects to select from to list on my resume, when in fact this was all I had to work with. Anyways, I also noticed that I was trying to list my individual contributions to these projects because I knew that recruiters probably don't want those bad group project partners. You know, the ones who don't do anything the whole time but take all the credit. Um, I did also add some random projects from high school, but ignoring those, overall the section showed that I did kind of know how to code and I could learn different types of skills if need be. So working on personal projects is a great way to build your resume. And I definitely should have done a lot more of this back when I was applying. And that's why I wish that I had discovered DataCamp, which happens to be today's lovely sponsor. This is an online learning community that offers interactive courses and even project guides in Python, R, SQL, and many more. They offer bite-sized lessons so you can learn in a way that fits your schedule. With more than 300 hands-on courses taught by everyone from directors at Nike to Kaggle Grandmasters, you'll never run out of things to learn. You can try out the first few chapters of each course for free, and after that, get unlimited access for just $25 a month. So if you want to try out DataCamp for yourself, I'll leave a link down below in the description bar. And yeah, thank you DataCamp for supporting my channel and back to the resume. So here, just a tiny sliver at the bottom of the resume was reserved for extracurriculars. Not a whole page, but literally just four lines. And I know that listing extracurriculars on college resumes is kind of controversial, but for me, when I used to screen resumes, I liked those personal touches. Because at the end of the day, these are college students, and they should have a life outside of leak coding and classes. So these little details probably showed recruiters that I wasn't just some confused pre-med tryhard, but was a tryhard in every other aspect of my life as well. And in an interview, these hobbies would serve as a point of conversation with my interviewer, which was a plus. So the real question is, did it work? And while I did receive a handful of interviews and ultimately one job offer, this was far from the ideal resume. And at the end of the day, I just didn't have that much to work with. So this was a pretty okay attempt at putting lipstick on a pig, as they say. But the good thing is, once I did receive those very few interviews, I finally had the opportunity to show who I was beyond this one sheet of paper and explain how my unique experience would make me an asset to the team. And especially for those with non-traditional backgrounds, whether it's having switched majors or even careers, the resume is so important in taking that slightly unexpected background and intriguing the reader enough to move you on to the next round. And at least from what I saw, a lot of people will actually be really excited to see someone who is a little different because those are the people that will bring a different, much needed voice to the table. But one thing to note is that this resume only kind of worked because I was applying to internships, not full-time. Hiring an intern is a low-risk investment to most big companies because there's not that much that you'll be doing or, well, 
messing up. Tech internships are basically extended interviews, three month evaluations of your potential to shine as a full-time engineer. So Amazon did make a gamble with accepting me, but I was able to prove myself and get that return offer. Had I applied to a full-time role with a similar resume, taking me on would have been a much bigger risk that honestly a lot of companies would be hesitant to do. So yeah, that's it for today's video. I know that I shared a lot of my own mistakes from over the years, but I want to know what have been your biggest resume mess ups. Also, I'll have a couple of useful resources and a link to Datacamp down below if you are interested. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a big like and subscribe. Follow me on social media if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next one information here. It's this was the yogi.